Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. If you've ever thought about building a model steam engine, this is the video for you. I am going to start with a casting kit and take you all the way to running on live steam in this video. This is a summary of the entire process of building one of these engines. If you want all the gory details, I have a playlist that has tons and tons of detail about every step in the process. But this video will give you an overview to see what you're missing. So let's go. Here is the kit I'm going to build today. It is a PM Research Model 1 steam engine. Hashtag not sponsored. I bought this kit with my own money. And uh, let's take a look at it here. So inside the kit here, we've got the drawings, of course. And underneath that, we've got the castings. There's the flywheel, very iconic. And let's take a closer look at these drawings. And this is the, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into moment. There's detailed sections for each part. There's three pages of that, so yeah, buckle up. It comes with the hardware and the smaller castings are all sprued together. There's the base right there, looking nice. All of this stuff is cast iron. Castings look really nice. The cylinder castings especially cool. And there's the crankshaft. Wow, that's a wild casting. It comes with bar stock for all the smaller pieces. And there's a bunch of bronze castings as well. There it is, one instant steam engine kit. Just add water. I tried that, it didn't work, so let's try adding hundreds of hours of machining instead. The exploded assembly diagram here gives you a sense of what we're in for, all the different parts and how they relate to each other. And there's a few build notes there to help you along, but mostly this is a figure it out yourself kind of situation. But the drawings are very detailed and I uh, didn't find any errors in them, so that's good. First chips, I'm gonna start by just machining the bottom of the base to just give myself something nice to sit on. And well, you are gonna get a serious case of model engineer fingers. This is all cast iron, it's messy stuff. So generally with machining these castings, you're trying to kind of average out the error in them and create reference surfaces. So I decided to reference everything off of these crosshead slides here. Seemed like a good place to start. So I machined these down to the right dimension. The critical reference on the entire engine is the center line. It's referenced in a couple of places from like the sides of the bearing caps and the sides of the crosshead slides. So it's all about getting this center line in the correct place and creating the finished surfaces that are gonna give you that reference. So that's where we're gonna start. That's the first job here is to create that reference. And of course there's a vertical alignment that we have to create as well. I did need a few specialty tools here. I used a long reach end mill to get down onto the sides. And the bearing caps are interesting because they're at a 45 degree angle. So I created a little fixture with a one, two, three block to machine these flat. I really should have done more features in this setup, uh, but you'll see here in a moment why I regretted not doing that. Now, you are also gonna need a lot of little special purpose fixtures for this project. So here's one for drilling the piston rod hole. I started by squaring up this block and then creating a T shape with a precision hole down the middle of it. This will make sense here in a moment, but I also need a drill extension. So I grabbed a piece of stock and I turned this down and then I drilled a hole part way into this and I'm gonna part it off. And Yahtzee, that's for the fans. Now you can see what that's all about. So I'm setting up the casting vertically here so I can drill the piston rod hole at the end. And I have to set up the casting in this orientation because my mill is too small to drill this hole from the other side of the casting. I don't have enough Z height. So I had to do some gymnastics here and drill it in this orientation. So the drill extension gives me the reach to get down there. And then that T block is a drill guide that references the hole to those crosshead slides and gives me the precise location for this hole. And uh, I have to say, this worked really well. It was unconventional, but it got the job done. Gotta do some fancy tricks sometimes to get around with small machine tools. But now I need to spot face the other end of that casting to mount the cylinder. And I need to do that from above. And again, small machine tools. So what I'm doing is I'm making a custom one-off fly cutter that's just barely like an inch and a half tall. It can just squeeze into the space that I have there and is gonna allow me to do this weird spot facing operation. So I made this little shouldered disc and I drilled a hole through it. And then using a needle file, I squared up the hole to fit a very small tool bit here. This is a small piece of high speed steel from which I can grind a tiny little turning tool, which will turn this into a very tiny fly cutter. So this is a very low profile thing. And with my mill all the way up, maximum Z height, it gives me 
just enough clearance to where I can come down on the top edge of this casting. So once again, using an indicator to square this thing up, I turned a little dowel to line up the hole that we made previously, and now I can come in with this very low profile specialty fly cutter and make this spot face. And this creates a round flat surface for the cylinder to mount to that's extremely square to the crosshead slides. That's really important. The cylinder has to be mounted square or the engine isn't gonna run right. And this is a good excuse to show off my favorite deburring tool. This is a collapsing inside deburring tool from Noga. It's a link to this below. I love that thing, it's so fun. There's the spot face, turned out great with that one-time use fly cutter. Yeah, I might use it for something else, it'll go in the drawer. On to the bearing caps now. These are tiny little fiddly castings. And the trick with these is getting all of the sides faced such that the cast details remain well aligned. The curved parts, which you don't machine, need to kind of be square to the sides that you end up machining. I didn't do great at this, I'll be honest, but uh, I learned a lot doing it. You can see the fixtures that I used here involving various toolmaker clamp and one, two, three block arrangements. The bolt holes get a nice little spot face for the bolt heads to sit on because it's a rough casting and you need clearance around the curved areas there. The underside of these caps get a step milled into them which registers on the base and aligns the bearings, keeps them aligned because you can't use bolts for alignment. Now I had to go back and set this up again to mill the step for the main bearing caps. I really should have done this all in one setup when I had the chance. I made a whole bunch of errors, in fact, on this step, and so go check out the full playlist for all of the gory details. I got it to work in the end, but there were a ton of mistakes made here on these bearing caps, so uh, the video was educational for how not to do this. To drill those through, I super glued the caps onto the base, and then I spot drilled them with a full size bit, and then that gave me a dimple into which I could drill with the tapping size to keep it centered. And then the threads are tapped and a little test fit here and the bolt goes in nice. And then when you're done, a little bit of heat breaks the super glue. Big moment now, it's time to create the main bearings. So I very carefully indicate and align everything and measure the positions of these bearings. And then they're center drilled, pilot drilled all the way through. And then I drill all the way through one size under the final dimension that I need to clear out the material. And then these are reamed to final dimension for precision. And once again, you know, I did okay at this. Getting this perfectly aligned is difficult and depends a lot on how well you machined the base casting and the caps, which I didn't do great at. There's the final bearing. You can see it's not super well centered, but it's certainly functional. On to the wildest casting in the set, the crankshaft. So it has that little extra piece in there that you leave in place because it helps support it during the early operations. So I faced the end as is tradition. And then I center drill this and I did the same on the other end because most of this work is going to be done between centers. Precision and maximum concentricity are very important with a crankshaft. So with that set up, I then proceeded to turn down the two legs of the crankshaft. There's a lot of tough scale here, so this was a little bit tough going, but did manage to get through it all. I definitely took my time here to really nail the dimension and make sure that there's no taper anywhere because it's really important for a crankshaft to run properly. And then it was set up on the mill to machine the sides of the crank webs there. It's mostly aesthetic. Now, for the rest of this, I'm going to need another fixture. Lots of fixtures when machining castings. So to do this, I got a piece of scrap that I've turned and I'm drilling and reaming a hole all the way down the center that's going to hold one leg of the crank shaft. As with all these fixtures, this will make sense in a moment. Over to the mill where I machine a trench all the way down one side of this thing. This little trench is also going to hold a leg of the crankshaft, which will make sense here in a moment. And hopefully no tiny X-wings fly down there while I'm trying to do this. The dimension here is really critical, the distance between the center line and this trench, because this sets the throw of the crankshaft. It's gonna control where the journal lands on that casting. So took my time there to get this perfect as well. I didn't use a ton of specialty tools on this project for a machine shop anyway, but one such tool were these adjustable parallels. These were a donation from a viewer and they are awesome for specialty measuring jobs. There's a similar groove cut down the end of this thing to hold one web and getting this square to the other trench that we cut was tricky. So you want to watch the full playlist video for this. But once that was cut, then we can turn it sideways and create a flat spot for some set screws. And this is going to hold the web in place in the fixture. Trust me, this is all going to make sense here momentarily. This is a very complicated fixture, by far the most complex one on the project. But look, a crankshaft casting is a difficult thing to hold. A lot of model engineers just fabricate crankshafts from bar stock, and I will not judge your life choices if you choose to do that. So here you can see one position for the crankshaft in this fixture. It goes down the center there. 
And then you can also set it off to the side like so. So both of these positions are gonna be helpful in machining the remaining features on this casting. So here's the center position in action and it's gonna allow me to face the outsides of the webs here. So that's about halfway done there. I still have some stuff to clean up in the middle there. And there's the final result of that operation. You can see how that fixture helped us out. Back over to the mill now and just clean up the remaining sides of the webs. And now, moment of truth, we can cut out that support web and put it back into our fixture. And now we can machine the insides of the crank webs. This gets a little hairy. I'm setting up an indicator so I know how far in I can go. Great thing about an indicator is it can tell you extremely precisely where you're going to die. I also ground a specialty very small turning tool, both a left and a right hand, for turning these inside crank webs. It was difficult to get in there, but get in there I did. To turn the all-important journal area of the crankshaft, I ground up another specialty tool. It's sort of like a wide parting blade. It's got a very square end on it, and I just went in real slow and took kind of rolling chips off of it like this and took my time. It's a lot of tool pressure, but run the lathe slow and this gave a really nice finish on that journal. And again, took my time to get the dimensions on that just right. There's the final crankshaft. That was a lot of work, but a really beautiful part. Crankshafts are really lovely things. On to the cylinder casting now. I started by centering up the bore by turning a mandrel that was a good fit in the rough cast hole there down the center. And this was honestly not the greatest way to do this. It's better to indicate the outside of the casting if you can, so that the final bore will be visually well centered on the casting. But functionally, this worked just fine. The engine will run just fine. So I bored out the cylinder, and then I used the boring tool to face the end in the same setup so that I know it would be really, really square. That's critical that the bore and the ends be extremely square to each other so that the piston will run straight when the cylinder is mounted on the engine. And of course the diameter of this is super critical as well. You can see me using my telescoping bore gauge there to really nail that dimension. To face the other end, I then set it up on an expanding mandrel so that I can reference the bore. Again, this was probably not the best way to do this, but it did work. This is another area of this project where I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot, so check out the full playlist for that. The bore is the reference for everything else, so I'm setting this up with an indicator in the mill to make sure that is horizontal. And then now I can mill out the steam chest. So I start by milling out the top edge, and then I mill the inside. I mill the port face flat and get that to the right depth. It's hard to see what I'm doing down there, so I stop and vacuum a lot. And then I mill the sides of the steam chest, which is mostly aesthetic. The uh, valve does not touch that. And lastly, with some specialty long, tiny end mills, I go down there and mill the valves themselves. So that's the center valve and then the transfer ports on the sides, which were pretty tricky to mill because I couldn't see what I was doing. And yeah, the center valve is too long there. I mismeasured that, but it still worked because it's still smaller than the valve itself. And then there was a few other miscellaneous threaded holes and bosses and things to machine, but now the piece de resistance is the steam plumbing from the ends of the cylinder down to the steam chest. So this starts with milling the tops of those flats so that you can drill and then very carefully drilling at exactly the right angle so that you meet up with the transfer ports underneath. This was a tense moment and I gotta say when that drill broke through in the exact right place in those ports that was one of the best moments on this entire project. Just like gas engines, steam engines need cylinder honing, and so I used a brake master cylinder hone for this, but in the full video on this section I discussed different ways people do this. A lot of people make honing contraptions for themselves. Now on to some of the little fiddly bits. There's a whole bunch of brass components, and there's two cylinder heads and a steam chest cover. A lot of the small stuff I did by just super gluing to an aluminum mandrel. And then the inboard head is bronze, so this has a boss cast into the back to help you hold it for specifically this situation. And then uh, I used a lot of my DRO's bolt pattern feature as well to drill these bolt circles, and uh, that made short work of that. And then the steam chest cover was fly cut, just because it's fun and I love using this fly cutter that I made. I have a video series on making this fly cutter. If you're interested, check out my playlist once again. And of course, lots of drilling bolt holes here as well. I use the DRO for these bolt patterns to make sure they all line up. So there's all the kind of little fiddly parts made from all the smaller castings. On to the piston rod now, which is made from stainless bar stock. And I single point cut the thread on this because it was tough stuff, difficult to get a die on there. So even though it's such a small thread, it hardly seemed worth doing, but was kind of necessary. 
used my thread checker here as kind of a go no go gauge on this. There's a link to this thread checker down below if you're interested. It's a great tool. Now on to the piston, which is a very iconic and cool part. This is just turned from steel bar stock. I ground a special grooving tool for cutting the grooves in it for the piston rings. The piston rings are Teflon and they come in the kit. The end needs a counter bore for the retaining nut, which I made with this two flute center cutting end mill, which the Brits would call a slot drill. I think in Yorkshire they call it a boot lorry lift. I'm not sure. And then this was parted off. Say it with me now. And Yahtzee. New viewers often ask, why do I say Yahtzee when I part things off? The answer is, I don't even remember anymore. I started doing it and people laughed, so I kept doing it and now it's just a thing. I'm sorry. Anyway, test fit with the piston on the cylinder there. With the little model engines like this, you don't need a full-blown ring compressor. You can just kind of coax the rings in there and make sure that that fit is good. And yeah, that looks like that might move some air or steam, hopefully. It's really critical that the piston rod and the bore all line up with the hole on the mounting surface on the frame. This alignment all has to be really, really good. So I ended up just dry fitting everything together and then using transfer punches to make marks on the frame. And this worked. I'm not sure it was the best way to do it, but uh, you know, I was worried if I just tried to measure everything, it wasn't going to work. So I thought by just transferring the marks physically with what I had machined, that in theory that would uh, leave a good result. And you know, it did work, but again, not sure it was the best way to do it. I've got just enough parts now to where I can put a little air in there and see some first signs of life. We can move the piston back and forth. Pretty cool. Time to make the valve, which is from this casting here. So we mill a little pocket in the bottom, which transfers the steam. And then two slots get milled crosswise on the other side, one for the valve rod and one for the retainer nut. So here you can see how these parts all fit together. The valve rod threads in there. That valve rod was made from stainless, just threads cut on the end. And that's gonna slide back and forth in there once it's all assembled. Now, a little more air, and you can see how the valve and piston work together. It's getting pretty cool. On to the valve gear now. I've got a casting for the clamp and bar stock for the eccentric. So the way you make these clamp-like features is you drill and tap the clearance and threading holes and split them. And then you put the bolts in. So I'll show you that in here in a second, but I'm gonna need a fixture to hold this thing in the lathe. So I milled up an aluminum block with a little extension block on the side that bolts down. And there's a little gap under that block so it creates a clamping action. And then the other end of the casting, I just bolt it down with that sprue that's left on there. So with that done, now I can split the casting with the slitting saw. And there's the two halves. So there's the rough clamp being formed. Now we can bolt them together, put it on the fixture, put it in the lathe, and bore out the center there of the strap. This is a very important component because of course it sets the valve timing for the engine. So we bore this out to dimension and very similar to how I did the cylinder, I also used the boring head in the same setup to face the side so that the inside and side surfaces are very, very square to each other because this runs in a groove on the eccentric. So that's very important. So that's looking good. Some deburring to do there, but in general, that's basically done. Onto the eccentric now, I cut a groove in the bar stock, the exact dimensions that we need for this. And that should be a good fit on the strap, which it looks like it is, that moves freely. Now I can create the eccentric feature. So I've used an indicator to offset it in the fore jaw. You can see how it's spinning all crazy like. So this is an eccentric turning operation, which is always exciting. And what I'm doing is creating the little boss that rides on the crankshaft. And that's gonna create the eccentric motion here. So it starts out crazy, but the more you machine, the more and more sense it starts to make visually. So now you can really see how we're forming a boss. So then that gets drilled and reamed to fit on the crankshaft. And then there's a set screw that retains that on the crankshaft. That's looking good. That's parted off. And there is the eccentric hub. This humble little fellow is the brains of the engine. Now we need a couple of more little fiddly bits. This is a clevis that I'm making here, a very tiny clevis that forms a bending link in the valve rod. So that goes together like so. There's a little pin there. So the eccentric and strap go on there, and now let's make the rod that connects them. A little bit of heat bends that into the right shape, and then the clevis joins it to the valve rod. And there is the completed valve gear. And now you can see how the crankshaft is gonna be able to time the piston motion. Now onto the crosshead. Steam engines have sealed cylinder ends, so the piston rod has to move straight, which means you need a crosshead to convert that into rotary motion for the crankshaft. 
This was machined in a vertical setup like this for reasons that are explained in the video. Check out the playlist. I didn't need a fixture for this, but I did make some packing blocks for a couple of steps. The bore on this is the reference for all the features, so I used a lot of gauge pins and other uh, interesting measuring setups. You'll want to check out the video for that as well. The crosshead is a nice fit on there, and then the piston rod threads into the end of it. There are some guides that go on top of that to hold it in place, and they are sprued together. So cut those apart, machine the bottoms nice and smooth, so there's this running surface there. And then there's a bunch of tiny, tiny holes that get drilled down through that. And that is a crosshead slide guide. And these I just transfer punched onto the frame. Again, I could have measured it, but I thought I was more likely to get a result that fits and works by doing it this way, since I know a lot of my machining is not perfect. I've got enough parts for another air test now, so I'll test the crosshead motion, and that's looking pretty good. On to the flywheel now. This casting's been camping out on the back of the workbench. Time for it to shine. I dialed in the rough casting area as best I could. This is important so that the flywheel doesn't look like it's wobbling when it's done, because you want the machined surfaces to be as concentric to the rough cast surfaces as you can get, which is not that easy to do, and I'm not going to claim I did that perfectly, but that's the goal anyway. So this is a pretty straightforward machining operation. I set it up on the faceplate because of the size of it. And that goes on to the crankshaft like so. If you're interested in the details of how the flywheel was machined, of course, lots more info in the playlist. Now on to the connecting rod. This is very similar to the eccentric strap. The threaded holes are made first and then you split it and then you can bolt it together again and set up for the remaining operations. Now, I ended up just tracing this onto a scrap of aluminum and milling a custom fixture to hold the whole thing because I just couldn't come up with a way to fixture it that I was happy with. And this actually worked quite well. Maybe not the easiest way to do it, but it certainly worked. Now I used the boring head to drill out the big end. And the reason I used the boring head is not for precision, but to fix a mistake. Again, lots of learnings here, all in the full video series. And the sides of these bores are also faced. It's pretty important that they be square to the bore for the engine to run well. And the little end is also a clamp. That's how it's retained in the crosshead. So that's split as well. And now we can test fit this on the engine. So the big end bolts onto the crankshaft and then there's a pin that goes through the little end and that's clamped on. And that is starting to look suspiciously like an engine. Now we need lubrication. There's a series of small oil cups, which I made with a form tool. This is from Brass Bar Stock. You drill those out and drill a tiny, tiny hole down through there. That'll drip oil in. Now the cylinder needs a displacement lubricator, so I needed a little T-pipe to mount that. So this was silver soldered from some pieces that I machined a little bit of plumbing out of. That's the final T-pipe there. It just injects oil into the steam. I did a video on displacement lubricators in the series as well, so check out that if you're interested in how they work. They're very cool, clever devices. So that's the lubricator there, and that's going to get oil into the cylinder when there's steam going in there. Now I can set the valve timing. There's a video in the series on this too. Valve timing is pretty interesting on steam engines. Okay, time for paint. I started with an etching primer. And then the final coats were done with this high temperature paint that is intended for engine blocks, but works great on steam engines as well. So get your Bob Ross on and do a little painting. Happy little steam engines. I also ended up making all custom nuts and studs from stainless bar stock for this because I didn't like the bolts that the kit comes with. They're perfectly functional, but they don't really look right. Now we need a plinth or a base for this engine to sit on, which I made from some scrap wood that I had lying around. I laminated three pieces into a cross-shaped block like you see here. And then I used this dollhouse brick sheet material. It's G-scale plastic brick sheet. And I glued this around the outside of the base. Brick is kind of a traditional look for steam engine plinths. And then I did some painting to make it look better. So I did a whole video on this process as well. So I painted some accent bricks and I did a sponge treatment and I did a black wash. Here you can see where I started and where I ended up on the painting. I also made a plastic cap that's supposed to look like wrought iron. Eh, not that happy with it. Might redo it, but studs are epoxied into the top of the base to mount the engine. And now I can start reassembly. So the bearing caps go on like so, and you can see all of the custom studs and nuts that I made there in action. I think they look a little better. 
and I need some gaskets. So the kit comes with this paper Felpro gasket material. So this is just a little bit of tracing and hole punching to make nice looking gaskets for those. And there it is, all assembled. First steam test. It's a little bit rough around the edges while it wears in and it needs to push the water through because everything's cold. But once it warms up, it's running very, very well, I think. It's got a bunch of leaks, which took a little time to sort out. Some studs needed tightening and I did end up remaking one of the gaskets because it wasn't great. And uh, you know, you gotta tighten up the gland packing as things run in and stuff. But uh, you know, a few leaks here and there is pretty typical for a steam engine's first few hours of life. But overall, I'm really happy with how that's running. This is running on real steam from a boiler that you can see in the background. It's actually an electric boiler. I do not have a video series on the building of that boiler, but I do have a blog post series on it, so I'll link to that below. But uh, let's let the engine do the talking here for a little bit. This was a lot and I know it was fast, but I'm compressing about nine months of evenings and weekends uh, into one video here just to give you a sense of the whole process. Apparently it takes the same amount of time to build a steam engine as it does to eh, make a baby. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little overview and do check out the playlist linked on the screen here right now if you want to see all of the gory details of this build. And if you like this video and my channel, throw me a little love on Patreon. There's a link there for that as well. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.